People are in my little dining room right now. And yeah. where, we're in your study or your living room or where? In your business. <laughs> really funny to see you. It's, it's sort of like, am I supposed to look at you in the screen or at the camera? <laughs> this is going to be the whole time, isn't it? it? It just, it's bizarre because it really is like saying, hey, how are you? But it's a Skype call. Is this too close? <laughs> Um, you are, as you mentioned to me, you have not done a ton of Skype interviews. This is one of the, one of the first, and right. I will, I can well, probably. This is the first. No, oh, this is the first. You should bill it as <clears throat> Eric Metaxas' first Skype interview ever. Okay, well, I am pumped to have you, and I will tell you, this probably won't lay the groundwork for you being bred and prepared for any other Skype interviews, because mine are like no other. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, this is Eric Metaxas, friend and one of my favorite authors uh, of, well, many books that I've read of yours, but Bonhoeffer, you know, is my favorite. But we're not going to talk about Bonhoeffer too much today. We're going to talk about your new book, Miracles, which we have discussed even before you read, wrote it. Did we lose you? Just kidding. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. No we're we're going to talk about Miracles, the book. We're going to talk about, I want to talk about your marriage and relationships because one time I did a whole interview with you and then we were driving you back to your hotel and you were like, you know what, I, we should talk about the, my whole dating relationship. And you told me the whole story and I was like, why didn't we talk about that? Wow. So I want to, we don't have a ton of time. And then she I also- up into two interviews then, seriously. Well, you know what? It was, it was a job in and of itself to nail down a date to, <laughs> to interview you. Just right now, just right now. That we'll just talk about one and then and then talk about another one. Talk about the other thing. Okay. Well, you you tell you just close your computer when you have to go, and I'll just keep asking questions. Okay. Here we go. So there's three M's. We're going to talk about your marriage. We're going to talk about the book Miracles, and we're going to talk about a movie you've been working on. Right. So we're going to start things off though with lightning round questions. All right. You just answer fast. Some of these questions, you just whatever comes to your head. All right. You, I know, are an expert interviewer. You do uh, yeah, Socrates. True. <laughs> true. Good. Hey, that one. Two. Who is someone you would want to interview right now? A Napoleon Bonaparte. Next. Okay. If you could help the young Americans of this world change one verbal grammatical error like you do for me all the time, um, what would it be? Oh, okay. Now, it's. I'm sorry you asked that because since I know I don't have to give you one quick answer, I'm going to give you three. Okay. Number one. People often say, I'm going to hone in on something. Hone in is 100% incorrect. Mm -hmm. It's home in, like a homing pigeon, homes in. Yeah. Like a bomb, homes in, goes home, homes in on the target. Not hone. Okay. Hone is when you hone something down. Wow. When you sharpen something on a whetstone, you hone down the blade so you can hone down your argument. You can tell I'm really passionate about this. Oh, this yeah. is so important. Oh, yeah. But there's one that's even more important for your generation, and this is going to blow some people's minds. If you're a sensitive person, look away. Everywhere I go now, these days, I say, thank you. And the response is supposed to be, you're welcome. No worries. Or, or my pleasure. And people say, no problem. Yeah. And I want to say, yeah, I know it's no problem because you're being paid to do what you're doing. It's just a weird, it's just a bizarre thing, like no problem. On like, the West Coast, we say no worries. Yeah, and no worries. Canadians and West Coast say no worries. But that is, in fact, eh, incorrect. And the answer is, you're welcome. <laughs> it's Thank it's, you. It's really like a plague, though. Like everywhere I go, people say no problem. And it's just wrong. Yeah. If you say you're welcome, People will smile. Hmm. All right. Um, okay. Let's see. I know you like to run. This is a, have you ever right. had a, true. True. Okay. So now we're on our fourth question. Fifth. Um, so have you ever had, would you rather questions? Like, would you rather this or would you uh, rather? I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll do whatever. Okay. I'm such an obvious to this. What do I know? Okay. You're going to love this. If you were told for the rest of your life, you could only run around the city of New York where you live, uh, New York City in all neon colors, including wrist and head sweatbands, all that, or never run again, which would you choose? Well, that's easy. I wear neon half the time anyway. Okay, good. Next. Neon. All right. You went to school at Yale. You were on the, you were in the humor editor for the uh, newspaper there and stuff. You, what did you get your degree in? Mm. Writing, probably. Uh, English. 
I'll say English. Okay. Um, so I'm sending you back to Yale on a full ride scholarship. What classes would you want to take or degree would you want to get? You know, that is a great question. Thank you. I don't know that I would get a different degree. Um, but actually, no, I would say history. History. Okay. History. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you were the editor of the humor, was it the humor magazine or was it humor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Humor magazine is called Yale record. It's the oldest humor magazine in the United States of America. Wow. Where, too. where did your sense of humor develop? Um, well, it started as a rash, like great. I can't show you, but it developed right here. And they never got the cream. <laughs> the doctor and they were able to. You know, they tried different stuff, but it just continued to develop. No, but like, were your parents funny? I mean, they were Greek. Well, actually, this is this is totally true. My um, my grandmother and my mom. My my mom's German, right? And mm -hmm. so my my German relatives are all like funny. They're, it's not sophisticated, witty banter. Yeah. But they're funny. Yeah. And I really mean it. And I think I, I just grew up like laughing at everything. And my, my mom would, you know, uh, say stuff when we we're watching TV. And it's not like she thinks of herself as funny. It's just the way they are. They just yeah. crack jokes or they, they make fun of everything, I think. And they yeah. laugh a lot. And you wouldn't expect that from Germans. You yeah. Think that would be. But no, we are. Yeah. So if you go to, to visit my relatives in Germany, was it East Which Germany? Which I will. Leipzig. They're just. Yeah, they're kind of goofy cut-ups in a in a way, you know. Right. Sort of, sort of like um, they they come from this small village called Großstöbnitz mm. or Großstöbnitz, yeah. and it, it's it's. Hey, I'm so, German. Ich reich. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And but I mean, it's kind of like the you know village life. Yeah. You know, they, they they um they have a good sense of humor. So I got it really from my German side more than anything. Although my uh, brother. And my cousin on the on the Greek side are are, are quite funny, have a sophisticated sense of humor. Oh, but I would say great. mostly from my German side, yeah. That's good. Ask me where I think I'm going to be ten years from now. Where do you think you're going to be ten years from now? Someplace untangling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, P.S. I'm sick. If you couldn't tell. Yeah. Broken foot and sick, and I'm pushing through to are you do gonna this interview. Me, are you going to tell me how you broke your foot? Yeah, aggressive trail running. You almost died running, yeah. and I broke my foot running, so I'd rather have my situation. What do you mean aggressive trail running? What the heck is that, some weird Portland thing? No, I just try to make myself sound cooler. No, I was uh, I had run up and up and up in Forest Park, which is like uh, just on the edge of downtown, and then I w it was kind of dusk, and I was running down way faster than I should have been. And I have a – what? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, Perfect. great. This is great. Yeah, I, um, I have very small feet in proportion to my body – uh, so I think it was the just pounding down and I think I must have stepped on a branch or a rock and broke my foot. So I'm sorry about times. that. Yeah. Did you break your fifth metatarsal? I think that's what it was. That's, that's, it's the smallest bone in the foot. I broke it uh, about 10 years ago. I was leaping over a snow drift here in Manhattan like because I'm, I'm more exuberant than people realize. And I, <laughs> I definitely I, have a very visual of you. I was, no, the funny thing is I just was – was psyched to leap over like not to go around because I'm I'm lazy I just want to go straight and I, and I just jumped over the snow drift and as I came up over the other side I realized somebody had shoveled out the other side oh, so no. I landed on I went four feet down and hit asphalt no. and I was wearing these bean boots which have no support and I yeah. just boom it was not fun wow so if you can break that bone That's why from I am the way I am today I, I can tell if 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 you broke that same bone from a leap, like a graceful leap I'm picturing, then it makes my aggressive trail running answer seem a lot more made up. <laughs> yeah, it does. No, it was, it was, uh, this is so off topic. It's fine. Let's, it's what we do. Let's move on. Let's move on. Okay. Well. But I'm so high on painkillers even now. I'm <laughs> I'm we both are. If I were sober. I would never consent to this. So take advantage. I will. Uh, I will. It'll never happen again. Okay. No, but I, I think you are so funny and I love your sense of humor. And I do want to just talk about that for a little bit. I asked you where your yeah. sense of humor developed. Oh, right, right, right. And right. What, what do you think, um, you know, because I've taken improv classes, you were a humor writer. Like, what do you think as you look at humor makes good humor? I've thought about this a lot and I think I have answers on this. Subject. I can tell you're not going to be truthful right now. Yes, I, I am. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. 
right, wrong. I think that um, humor ultimately is about truth telling, right? Mm -hmm. Those court jester. The idea is that you speak the truth and people, because you're not supposed to say these things, when people hear it, either they chop your head off or they laugh, you know, yeah. because so, um, so I, I think it has to do with, with, with speaking truth. I also think if you think about what humor actually is, humor, and this is a little bit tough to, to get across, but it's as if you're making conscious what's unconscious, meaning that you've got a thought yeah. that, that's there in your mind, but it's yeah. not at the forefront of your mind. Maybe you don't permit yourself to think that. Yeah. And the funny person says that thought, and it's as if that thought leaps from the unconscious mind to the conscious mind. And it's like, I, I really think that when things move from the unconscious to the conscious, it's like there's this frisson of movement between them. And it, it we laugh or we cry. There's something... I don't mean to get so metaphysical so yeah. soon, but I think that that's true. And I also think people who have a quick mind, I know I have a quick mind, whether it's used for good or ill. <laughs> I, I, I actually, this is actually true. I say this, it's just a bizarre thing that in the theaters, if I'm in a movie, uh, I will, like there'll be a joke, I will laugh, and then almost a full second later, the theater will laugh. And I thought to myself, I noticed that a couple of times, I thought this doesn't make sense. And yeah. then I figured out, okay, I'll be right back. I'm going to turn my phone off. Oh, it's fine. No, unless it's we're afraid of what the, unless we're afraid you're going to have a voicemail that we're going to hear right now. No, I, I don't, I typically don't get voicemails. That phone's not supposed to, that phone's not supposed you to ring. You want to cruise to Hawaii. Right. Do cruises okay, go to Hawaii? So, okay, sorry. But, but it is, it's an odd thing. That's when I noticed that I, I also had a brainwave test done one time and, and they said, yes, you, your, your mind is very fast. And I think that some kinds of humor flourish that way in the sense that I say the thing just before somebody else thinks of it yeah. and in a sense pull it out of their from their unconscious to their yeah. conscious mind. This is this is deep humor theory, you understand? No, I love it. And I've I've I do think that that is um no, and I think when I when I was taking improv, my teacher would always he would always be like, "Stop trying to be funny." He's like, "Be real," and then it is that thing. Then the audience, if, if it's too out there and too like, right. oh, "I'm a clown," you know, that's right. that's not funny compared with if the if the audience can, member can go yes with their head. So that's what you're doing. That's correct. You're yes. you're handing them the yes, and then they right. feel the freedom to laugh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love that. Okay. Um, I also, I picture you writing uh, as this really, your background matches the image I have of you writing books this by is like. Totally phony. <laughs> this is, this we is have my. green screened it in. This is at my study, right? <laughs> I never write in here. Really? This, I'm, I'm sitting at this desk. I never, ever write at this desk. Okay, well, I don't picture you writing why, by don't. candlelight and ink and quill, which is probably correct. That's so sweet. I know, I know. Um, but I can't picture you like watching TV. But do you? And what shows do you watch and like why? I, I, it, it's interesting. I don't, I guess I feel like a big thing for me is not wanting to waste time. It yeah. doesn't mean that I don't waste time, but I feel like I wasted a lot of time in my life and I feel really badly about that. Yeah. And so I'm always thinking is what I'm doing, moving the ball forward, whatever yeah. that is. And that, that, that doesn't just mean in my career, it means in relationships, my spending time with my wife or with my daughter or with a friend, uh, with family. And I think that TV for a lot of people, if you're, I mean, if you're really baked, you're just mm -hmm. tired, you work a hard job and you come home, it's, it's perfectly legitimate to, to watch TV. And that's kind of when I watch TV, when I really yeah. can't do anything else, I yeah. think. And what do I watch? I don't ever watch shows, like yeah. shows, whatever, whatever great shows there are out there. I've just kind of decided I don't have time yeah. to follow whatever it was, whether it was The Sopranos back when or today, you know, s something else. I just don't, um, I just don't feel like I have time to yeah. do that. And so I'll usually watch news yeah. or uh, I will very often watch Turner Classic movies. Hmm. And does that get If I had mind? one station that I would want, it would be Turner Classic movies. Just because it's just usually guaranteed quality like instead of some trash that i just think why am i watching this 
-hmm. almost always it's just it takes you pulls you into a beautiful world you know uh i mean they're not all from the 30s and 40s but i i love old movies there's something about them that um that i enjoy plus since it's turner classic movies most of them are good they're you know they've been established as classics yeah. so yeah. uh so that works in form but but yeah turner classic movies are just pretty much i feel like I you're thought. kind of Sometimes I feel like you were plucked out of like an older era. I don't know if it's like the way you dress or what, but you had that birthday party where it was all like you sang old songs by piano yeah. and people wore tuxes and stuff. Do you just, are yeah. you drawn to that older era? I think it's an affectation. No, I don't know. I, I don't know I that word. Think, I think it is, I, I think the answer is yes. I think that there's something that we've lost something pretty big in our culture. I mean, I, I feel like something happened in the 60s, let's say, where we decided as a culture that new is good, young is good. Mm -hmm. And most of that thinking is incredibly stupid. Yeah. But we've decided to run with it for 50 years. And it, it is, it's a pity because there is so much uh, quality in the past. I mean, yeah. if you go to Europe and you see some of the old buildings, you have to ask yourself, now, why is it that we haven't built anything like this in the last 100 years, 50 years? Why is that? Yeah. Civilization, in some ways, was, was much more sophisticated. And so there's a lot about the past that I admire. It doesn't mean there's nothing good in the present or that I hate the present. I mean, that's not at all the case. I love a lot about the present. But I, I just think that um, the, the sort of the retro looks appeal to me, uh, a lot of older music. But, I mean, you know, that – that's often the 70s, not the 20s, you know, so I, it, I'm not trying to be consistent here. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to, I would love to keep talking about that, but we have to get on to your marriage and Miracle's book. So um, you helped my dad uh, write his very first self-published book, which a lot of people don't know about, Motivating Your Man God's Way, which I really wish you would have pushed to have a different title. <laughs> I I didn't feel like I had the freedom yeah. to tell him what to do with the title. Yeah. Well, I but yes, I appreciate you helping him on that. But um, so you have been kind of there from the beginning with what my parents have done with love and respect. Um, but it wasn't until this last time you were in Portland that you told me the story of uh, how you and your wife met. And I know that a lot of the people that um, write in or listen to the videos that I do are yeah. are getting older. I mean, the demographic is 18 to 35, and you got married older, correct? I was 33 Okay. When I got married, yeah. And, and Cher, I think you just had an interesting story because you guys were together, and then you broke up for a while, yeah. and you said you were like, sometimes I don't understand why that happened, like why we had to yeah, go Yeah, it was very painful. I mean, I'm per perfectly transparent about it. It was really painful. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to ask the Lord, why did it have to be that way? Yeah. And sometimes there is no answer. Sometimes God is just knows that we need to be humble or we need to, he, it, it's, sometimes it's pointless to ask, but I do ask because it was yeah. not, it was not fun. And how ridiculous that courtship or engagement shouldn't be fun but in some ways it wasn't fun because of the way it happened yeah um you know i i my demographic of people who visit my site are 18 to 35 and i know a lot of people i'm 32 there is this thing from culture and even the church of just like you've got to find the right person and so i think sometimes fear of it not being perfect is the thing that causes us to run away from a relationship that might be good and ultimately you chose that your wife was good in the end but you had this was it you freaking out did you like um no she broke things off I, no well no i i broke things off but oh i see what you're saying i don't know what you, you were getting at Sorry. Uh, basically we i mean I'm, I'm sort of a strange bird and it comes from my being strange and from from my theology on dating let's say right yeah like i think that the modern view of dating is a joke because God didn't create us to have these mini relationships mm -hmm. and then to break up and have mini relationships. That, that's just, it doesn't mean that it can't work, sort of, but it's not the way it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work really is supposed to, we're supposed to court someone. We're supposed to say, who do you want me to marry, Lord? And pray that he would lead me in a way that's a little bit deliberate. And I think you can get to know somebody pretty well outside of a dating context. Does this make any sense? Yeah, I mean, I don't totally agree, but I see what you're... I mean, I... Well, what, what I mean is that friendship yeah. is 
first of all, even the word date, people totally misunderstand this basic word date. Yeah. In 1940, a date meant I could go on a date with, with, with a guy friend to we go skating. Uh, or I'd go on a date with, a, with a, a, a girlfriend, not a girlfriend, but a friend who was a girl and uh, her brother. And we, you know, so to make a date simply meant to set up a time that we're going to do something, yeah. right? And so if you are doing that a lot with somebody, of course, you're, you're dating. But the point is that it had a lot less romantic pressure. It was yeah. not... It was not like, oh, we're going to go on a date and we're going to look into each other's eyes and figure out. You know, it yeah. was more like we're going we're gonna to do social things within certain boundaries yeah. and see, do we get along? How does that feel? How do her friends feel about me? It, it was, I would say it was a lot less pressure. Yeah. And, and so I think what we've done is we've created a world where we have this, this pressure and people fall into these relationships which, where there's a level of intimacy that is not meant to be outside of marriage. Now, the o most obvious example of that is physical intimacy. Yeah. But even if you get that part, because I've seen people who get that part, and by the way, that part's very important in case anybody you know, is not on board with this. You know, Physical intimacy is made for marriage. And if you don't do it in marriage, you're gonna, there are going to be problems. There are all kinds mm -hmm. of problems. But the fact of the matter is that that level of intimacy, physical or emotional, is meant for the safety of marriage. Yeah. And that's because God wants to bless us. He doesn't want our hearts to be ripped out. He doesn't want our lives to be ruined. And so we have this world where at least the emotional intimacy gets way ahead of where it needs to be. And so mm -hmm. you're finding things out about the other person and they're seeing this ugly side of you. And that's just not appropriate outside of marriage because it's not really safe. And so that sounds like, I mean, I would think that your objection would be like, but don't you want to know about the other person? And mm -hmm. I would say yes and no. There are things you want to know and there are things you don't want to know because there are things that, if you really commit yourself to first and say, I'm going to love this person till death do us part, stuff is going to come out in the marriage that you're going to say, you know, I don't like that. And maybe if I would have known this, I don't know that we would have been married. But now mm -hmm. you're married. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you deal with it and you're, that's really loving another person where you're saying that I don't care if there's things I don't like. I'm going to love you. I'm going to be there for you. Yeah. And you're gonna, I'm going to let you see ugly stuff about me that other people don't see because they think I'm perfect because they never see me at home when I'm, you know. And I think that's something, there's something really sacred about that in marriage. Mm -hmm. And to, to let that bleed into these relationships we have, which are kind of like mini marriages, like we know all the stuff we're hanging out, we're getting to know each other. And it, I think that, just to cut myself off here because I can go on for days, um, in a way, there are things that, like I think about the one relationship that I had that was really serious before Suzanne, right? Before yeah. I became a Christian, I was in a relationship with somebody. It ended up being five years. And I think there's two bad things, at least there. Number one, I, I feel... It, it's almost like you get so close to somebody that to never see them again it's like saying goodbye to a brother or a yeah. sister. It's just fundamentally unnatural. You're not yeah. supposed to be that close to somebody uh, if you might not always be with them. There's yeah. just something weird about that. Yeah. But also I think to myself that there are certain things I shared with that person, whether it's the physical but in, on any level of intimacy, that should have been only for my spouse only. And I think that in a lot of these relationships, we, we give parts of ourselves to other people. And uh, it's really not, uh, I would say it's not God's first best. And so yeah. for me, uh, I, that, that was, yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's my, that's my thinking on, on, on yeah. marriage. But, but specifically, you were asking me about... Well, like, what was the impetus to you guys taking this break that you've said now you regret? Um, I think... Probably I was not in, in a healthy peer group that w w could have like helped me with this. Hmm. So I felt like, oh, I've got to make a decision. I don't know. And so I had this, I just had a number of questions. And I think I thought, well, the only thing I can do is break up because it wouldn't be fair to Suzanne if um, I'm sort of leading Uncertain. her on or something yeah. like that. And so I didn't really, I didn't really understand this stuff. Yeah. And so we, so we broke up for, I guess it was almost six months. And 
at the end of those, I kept thinking about her and thinking about her, and then finally I thought, look, the heck with it. I, I need to call her up. Like, I need yeah. to call her up. And I called her up and said, could we get together? And she'd been really hurt. Yeah. And that's the other thing. I had no clue. I was so stupid. I had no clue that that would be the, the result. Somehow yeah. I thought, yeah, I don't know what I thought. I thought a number of things, but I, I had no clue that she would be really hurt, devastated. So when I got back together with her, she was just wounded and not ready to, you know, uh, open herself up again in a yeah. way. And that was just heartbreaking to me because yeah. I was finally at a place where you I were ready that I wanted to be with her. And so the way the, the way that it happened was just in retrospect, you think that's a really dumb way to do it. Yeah. Uh, so. Do you think sometimes that it's like, I, I did a series on the one and like, is there the one for us? And the second one of the three I talked about, there's some the answer, people. No, there's not. <laughs> oh, I know. I, I agree. think that's totally wrong. It's like so stupid. But, yeah. yeah. Um, but the second one I talked about, there's just, there's different personality types and there's some people who have always been able to just go, I'm going to make a decision. I'm all in. And then yeah. there's other people who like are in their head and they weigh yeah. everything and they've heard yeah. all these stories of someone being like, I just knew that she was the one for me. And so then they're paralyzed by making a choice. Right. So what would you say to guys who might have be in like a similar situation with you, like where they're, they're weighing things in their head. They don't yeah. know, like, would your advice be get, people around you kind of thing and well I would say in a funny way I think that the church the culture is like on another planet of stupidity on this like the, the culture has almost nothing to say it's the culture is totally broken and they're just trying to like deal with the rubble and and just figure like that's just the way it is but I mean I would say the church hasn't done a great job with this and part of the reason I would say for example most guys younger guys if I would counsel with them or talk with them my advice w with them would be like get married that that you're you're doing something in your head that is it, it's really counterproductive game playing that it's got to be perfect or it's it, it's got to be and it, this comes as a result of kind of what i was saying like yeah. if you have a, a healthy dating structure right yeah that girls look their best for the date guys are on their best behavior for the date that leads to marriage once you start getting casual with each other believe me it's it's just absolute human nature to to begin thinking well hmm, i don't know it's not as exciting or or something like that yeah. so in a way we have to trick ourselves and but it's not a trick it's the way we work and it's the way culture used to work culture yeah. used to have dating rituals that helped people like people were helped by the dating rituals now mm -hmm. every culture is a little bit different and that's another part of the problem because of the diversity of different groups of people and things. It sort of screwed up that we, we had these cultures where everybody knew the rules. Now, it's like when you go to a wedding now, like what songs are they gonna play? It's just like this chaos. Yeah, It's true, like we, we've lost that, you know, uh, the way we do things. I'll never forget, I went to a wedding in Puerto Rico uh, probably 20 years ago. And I remember they knew how to do wedding. Like they did the Puerto Rican wedding. They had certain songs they played and certain dances and certain things and I thought, this is so beautiful yeah. because they all know what the rules are here. Mm -hmm. And if you go to certain Greek weddings and if you get, but in America, we've kind of lost this. There's a, there's a chaos yeah. and it's gone into the dating world too. Like, how do you date? Yeah. Nobody really knows anymore. Like yeah. we just, we don't like that, but we never really replaced it with anything. So I guess, um, yeah. So the, I would say the short version is that the old fashioned way of doing things really serves people. Um, we tend only to hear about what was wrong with it, but I think there was a lot more right with it and that people are, are hurting because we don't know how to do this anymore. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think when I said I disagree, I, 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 I think it was more of the sense, I feel like, you know, each culture is going to have their new thing to deal with. And I feel like at this point, we, the way to get to know someone is kind of dating, but it's always like whatever the time period that you find yourself in, I think as Christians, it's like, yeah. it's how you said, it's being prayerful of like, of each relationship that you're entering into, knowing that it's not a formula, knowing that everyone has different personality differences, right. knowing that if you go through a freak out situation, that it doesn't right. mean that God can't redeem the situation. Um, and I think just giving people grace for the fact that we really 
at this point, we do have a lot of baggage because with the delay of marriage, we're just bringing in different things and yeah. grace yeah. and commitment. Like what you're saying, if like people just got married, but the thing is we have so many people now that are giving up on marriage three years in that yeah. it's almost like you, on one hand, I'm like, I totally agree with you. But since there's a lack of like what this yeah. is, I almost want people to know all the dirt. And then if you're going to make a yeah. decision, then you, yeah. you, you know stuff. But I, I see what you're saying though. Well, I would say, look, that you're right. This is very complicated, not something we could solve in a Skype interview. <laughs> but um, I, I think what I would say again to most people, like my generic advice, which is not absolutely not always true, but I would mm -hmm. say generically, people should get married younger. Yeah. Uh, the longer you wait, things come up. It's just I'm not going to go into it. But yeah. I, I see a lot of people that I think that person should have got married when they were 23 or 24. And when they didn't, it, it didn't, I mean, it depends on the person, but generically, if somebody asks me, yeah. I was 33, but I'm, I'm just saying that generically, I think that's true. And then I think people have to have a higher view of marriage. Like people have to understand divorce is not an option. Mm -hmm. If you think divorce is an option, you're not really married, basically. Mm -hmm. Then then you're thinking, well, we'll see how it goes. And it, it, it's not about that. I mean, of course, some people will always get divorced and there's yeah. grace, you know, yeah. but we really need to think that this is this incredible thing that God has created for life. And we need yeah. to take that really seriously. And I think often Christians don't take it that seriously. Yeah. Have you heard of Shanti Feldhan's new book, uh, The Good News About Marriage? No. Yeah, she's totally debunking. Um, actually, my interview with her just went up last week. The 50% uh, divorce stat, that it's wrong. And she's yes. researched for six, seven years. And one of the things that she said is because of that incorrect stat that so many people do go into marriage, even if they're going, divorce is not an option, divorce is right. not an option, they still subconsciously know right. we only have a one in two chance of making it, which right. is not true. And so right. she said anytime futility is a part of the mindset, like this this could end, you're that yeah. much more likely to live into it. And so, yeah. Totally. yeah. Um, so it's a great, it's a very short read, good book. I think you would... The, the stats are awesome. Um, did, you, did you plug my book in your interview with her? Yes, I did. Yeah, okay, no. Um, I have been telling people about your book, and so we will transition. Oh, no, no, no. I wanted to ask you one other thing. Yes. Uh, you have a teenage daughter. Uh, yes. And do you talk to her about dating or relationships? Um, it's <laughs> do you not leave always that to your possible wife? to actually talk to her because she's 15, and it's not always possible. It, de it depends. I mean, I think that um, – I, I do my best. I don't want to, you know, you, you don't want to be an overbearing parent. Uh, and uh, at the same time, you want to be a parent, you yeah. know. And so I think it's a balance. I think it's a balance. We, we will see. She goes to a um, all-girls school. It's like a really great school. And I think that helps a lot. And then you because keep I her think, locked in the study. Yes, yes. No, I keep her in a pumpkin shell. But... <laughs> But the thing is that uh, you, you can get them on, on uh, Amazon. <laughs> but uh, we, I guess I, I really do think, again, practically speaking, if you live in a culture that says like dating is the norm, right? Yeah. And high school dating is the norm. I, I think high school dating was the norm in the 50s when people got married at 18 and 19. And, and I think that that was, but I have to ask, you know, what is dating? And again, yeah. if I think dating is really supposed to be courting, who am I supposed to marry? Um, you had this like, you know, when the debutantes come out or, or this in the old days, if you read Pride and Prejudice, that at some point the, you know, the, the family's ready and that now my daughter is ready to entertain suitors, right? Yeah. She's ready to get married. Okay. Yeah. Before that, she's not ready to get married. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I see kids in high school dating, I think, I don't know where you're going with this. Like, yeah. It seems inevitable that this is going to go in a sexual direction. People are going to get hurt, whatever. And I think just like with the 50% marriage lie, you have to say it doesn't need to be that way. Like mm -hmm. people think, well, that's just the way it is. No, it's not. Yeah. I know plenty of people who just don't do that. They yeah. just don't, they don't take any of that seriously. And so spending time in groups is really healthy. You get to know people, you get socialized, but it doesn't have that weird romantic pressure going on. And I have no idea what question I'm answering. Where do you... <laughs> About how you talk to your daughter. But I think, honestly, having that conversation of asking her questions like, what is dating to you and what does this look like? I yeah. think the open dialogue, yeah. the more you can be open with her, the better. Because yeah. I know for me, like, 
I kept I kept my that part of my life very private from my parents yeah. sure. until later in life. And now the fact that we can be open about everything, there is such freedom to the point where I, I feel comfortable going out on dates and meeting all sorts of people in hopefully more of a casual setting, but yeah. I, because I know people know where I'm at. I know that right. I, no one's going to let me get to a point, hopefully, where I right. do anything too stupid because it's just right. kind of like, let's invite community into this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wish I would have t- been open, more open with my parents mm-hmm. in high school than I was um, because then it became a kind of a duplicitous, like I've got to keep this part of my life private or whatever. So. Do, they, do they know you were in jail? Uh, they don't know that part yet, but hopefully that. they okay. won't watch this. Yeah, okay. cut that out. Okay. Um, okay, so let's get on to your book, Miracles. Um, you stab some people, right? What? I do. You stab some people? Yeah. When you yeah. were in the jug? Yeah. Hey, you know, the hard Better streets of East out. Lansing, Michigan. That's, you oh, know. Very tough. Very tough. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, your new book, Miracles. I read it because you sent, like, a, a, an electronic copy, um, mm. and I read it in, like, a day. That, do you know, I just said, I was at a coffee shop this morning telling a friend about, um, about your book and I was telling him about Bonhoeffer and I was like, I've never read a book that long. <laughs> like, yeah. like literally Bonhoeffer like just makes me feel smart. Um, that I read that was that my goal to make my friends feel smart yeah <laughs> but what I was telling him is I was like he has this amazing ability to write history and give intellectual or historical or academic information but you still insert humor a little bit you you, you humanize it so much that I felt like at the end of Bonhoeffer that he was my boy you know and that I understood his story and I feel like in miracles you do the same thing and you you run in very academic circles but then you're addressing this thing that usually is associated with very like spiritual people who are like, you know, maybe yeah. more charismatic or whatever. Yeah. But you tell all these stories. You go through you go through scientific stories, biblical stories, and then stories of people that you personally know. So there's trust with that. It's a total hodgepodge. When yeah. I was writing this book, I said, I have no idea what it's going to end up being. So I just want to – I mean, I just think we all have this basic curiosity about – miracles about what's out there and what's it like and how does it get in here how does god reach into this world or or is there such a thing is there anything beyond this world depending on whether you're an atheist an agnostic or some kind of believer but we all have these basic questions and we should be able to just talk about it and yeah. open it up and let's talk let's see what we figure out and then i so the first part of the book is about like what are miracles and then are they even possible? You know, mm-hmm. when you look at science, what does science say? And there's, a, I mean, I get into a lot of different stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I get into the formation of the universe, the, how the moon came into being, some stuff that totally blew my mind. I had no idea it would be so extraordinary and fascinating. So, so you got it, you got into more of the scientific stuff in as the, you were researching the, the book. Yeah. And it, and it just totally amazed me. And I said, I have to put it in here. But then, um, I, you know, I talk about some biblical miracles. I talk about everything, but then the second half of the book, as you already said, is miracles. Yeah. Stories of miracles that have happened either to me or to people I know, mostly to people I know. And it had to be someone that I knew yeah. because I don't want to have to do, you know, to think too hard about do I trust this person. I, yeah. I want it just to be these are people I know, so I can vouch for this person. And I think sometimes those kinds of things are the best evidence. I mean, you can talk all you want about science or whatever, but when you talk to a human being and you get to know them and you realize that they're level-headed, they're emotionally uh, mature, and they tell you the story, you, or you're stuck. You have to say, okay, they're definitely not crazy. Yeah. They're definitely not uh, lying. Yeah. So how do I explain this? And even yeah. if you don't explain it exactly the way I do, you're forced to think about what if? Is this possible? And I think most people believe these kinds of things are possible, but they need somebody to talk about it in a way that is, on the one hand, slightly skeptical and at the same time open-minded, to yeah. have both, not just to be sneering, that's all stupid, or to be so gullible that you know uh, everything's a miracle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's what you said a great line in the book. You were like, if a miracle happens in the forest and there's no one there to see it, is it still a miracle or something like that? And I think that is. It's like that. that's one of your points, like, Miracles are for us. They're for us, right. Yeah. It's, it's basically, I mean, when we're talking about God doing a miracle, um, he does it to communicate with us. I mean, he, yeah. he could have saved the Israelites in a way other than parting the Red Sea. Yeah. He didn't need to do that. He did that specifically for them so that 
through the eons, through the millennia, they would remember what God did. And I think that almost every single miracle is like that. It's God trying to speak to us. He could do it another way. Yeah. But it is so balanced because you aren't just like all on this one side because you do address all the questions that people ask. That's why I think I love with your academic background. You're like, I know what the critic's going to ask of like, well, why doesn't God always do miracles? Why does he only sometimes heal? And I went through, I went through back in 2012, like the whole year was like a struggle for me asking the question, does God still do miracles in the 21st century? And I just went on this hunt for just some personal things that were going mm-hmm. on for me. And then also just themes that kept coming up in Bible studies or what I was reading. And I realized that there was like this, this theme to like the, that connected with like the why or when he would do a miracle. And it was always like, to show that he was remembering that person, that he was actually taking action and that he loved, that he loves us. You yeah, know, most, there, there are a bunch in, in my book that are like that. There's like, I think there's 30 stories or something, but there's yeah. a number of them that the whole point of it is God communicating. I'm here. Yeah. I love you. I know what you're going through. That is so powerful. Yeah. When you're hurting and you know that God took the trouble to communicate to me yeah. by doing something that's, it really, that's what it's all about, basically. Yeah. Oh, Nobody that woman who was there. like, who had taken so much time out of her life to like take care of her sister's children and that story was, I mean, they're all. She's, she's a really good friend and um, yeah, she really suffered. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. Well, and then I think you, to your own personal testimony of like, you came to know the Lord when you were in college or right out of college, right? Yeah. Right. Out of college. And so again, you're coming from Yale and you have a very, like you have a very dramatic dream and I won't say it because I won't want people to read it. But then what I loved was that you shared your story at a college and then the next morning you got this email where a guy was like, I thought your whole talk was, you know, ridiculous, whatever. And you're like, great, why why are you doing this? And then he goes on to say like how the exact same thing happened. Well, no, it's even, it's even more than that. He said, I get an email, I I spoke at a college and well, I'm just saying it's just go to ericmetaxas.com because if you want to know what i'm talking about but the story is that jesus appeared to me in a dream it was mind-blowing it was in a dream so i tell the story in depth at this college and the next morning i wake up and i get an email from one of the students who was there There like two thousand students listening and it was one of the best talks i I thought the connection was the most intense connection i've had with an audience that i could remember it was amazing but i get this email the next day from one of these two thousand students who did not like it and he says something like i didn't enjoy it blah 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 in fact as i was walking out of the auditorium I said to a friend of mine, oh, yeah, right, maybe God will speak to me in a dream. Ha ha. And his next line was, and last night God spoke to me in a dream. Yeah. And it was a life-changing dream. Yeah. And I, I just thought, see, <laughs> miracles happen now, yeah. like right now. But what do you, and so what do, you say with, what do you say, though, to the critics, though, that would say, well, that's just, you know – thing synapses going off in our mind of what we yeah. really want to happen or even just like the scientific you know there's so many people that are like i don't believe in god because i believe in science yeah the, I, I i i debunk that in the but when people say that it's really hard for me not to laugh or sneer it is so stupid like some of the greatest scientists in history were strong christians yeah who specifically were into science because of their faith. Like yeah. this ridiculous idea that faith and science are at odds, it's just, it's just silly. And I, I mean, I talk about that yeah, in the beginning, in, in, the, in the book. And, you know, it's all about context. I mean, if you tell me a story, I'm right away going to know where the, where the holes are in the story. I'm going to say, wait a minute, what about this? What about this? Yeah. That's what I do in the book. When I tell these stories, I, I try to make it clear um, that just because somebody says something is a miracle or whatever, it could have a natural explanation. But yeah. Ones that I put in the book don't seem to have any nat- nat- uh, natural explanation. And the story of this dream, it depends on what the dream was, right? But when you hear the dream, uh-huh. it's pretty hard to believe that yeah. uh, his brain invented this crazy dream. I mean, it really Which I was it. bummed about that. You didn't put his dream in the book. It was, it's a really complicated dream. Okay. So I, I figured it's gonna, you're going to lose people. And it gets into some personal stuff. Yeah. He, had really, uh, he lost his mother to suicide. Hmm. And it was really, uh, yeah, that was kind of part of it. So yeah. anyway, but it was, yeah. Um, yeah, that just happened a few, two years ago. Wow. Well, I mean, the book is powerful. And like with Bonhoeffer, it's like it doesn't, you are so smart and that comes out. But then these stories drive it. And it's just for someone like me who needs, 
I, I can't I can't have it be too heady or I'm lost and I can't have it be too fluffy and you you're just great. Oh, okay. You're well, a good writer. That- Has anybody ever told you that you're a pretty good writer? Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you this though, I I deliberately say to to friends like if you get bored with the first couple of chapters on science, just skip it and read the stories because the stories are anybody could read the stories. They're so they're amazing stories. They're but just I amazing. Will, you know? I will go. I will disagree with you once again, and I will tell the people who get bored of science read that because you're going to have conversations with people who will make that comment. I don't believe in. So if you if your inclination is towards God and more like the mystical, whatever, force yourself yeah. to read the academic because you need to you need to know things. Force so, yourself. That's I need what I meant. to be force your PR to... agent. Well. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to give all the information of where people can buy this book, and I if I read it in a day. And it's, and it's a, how many pages? It's a lot. You're just not that bright. Let's you face know, it. Let's, let's do that. Hey, I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> um, but okay, so I want to move on to a uh, movie. That's our third M, Marriage Miracles movie. They are making a book out of, or a movie out of Bonhoeffer, and I'm so pumped about it. Have yeah. you cast me yet? Uh, yes. I've cast you into Outer Darkness, and I apologize. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I actually, it's interesting. I have learned so much about filmmaking because uh, we're we're the producers on the film, right? Yeah. So we're working with the whole team of us, but we raised, you know, upwards of twelve million dollars, which is astounding to me. I, you, you kill? know, people maybe think that that's not a big deal. I am amazed that we did it. We did it fairly quickly, but we've rewritten the script a bunch of times because we want it to be perfect, right? Yeah. We want it to be just right. And uh, so we had, uh, we were moving forward with casting, but then we stopped everything because we've decided exactly how we want to change the script. So we want to get that right. Yeah. But we are in really, really, really good shape to say that we already have the money. We have our director. We have our locations. We, yeah. we pretty much have everything figured out, except we got to get the script Perfect. exact before we can officially cast. Yeah. So the but fact that I. Come out next year would, would be my. 2015 or yes. 2016. 15. 15. Okay. Yeah. So the fact that I gave one of those 12 million, is that does that help with me getting in the film at all? You know, your million turned out really not to be a million dollars. I looked into it. Oh. And it wasn't, uh, something went wrong in the transaction. An and investment. Being on... No money at all. So. <laughs> I can write but, a check. But that thank says you a for trying. <laughs> yeah, for trying. Um, okay. Well, that's exciting. I didn't know that it hasn't gone, it hasn't gone into production yet, but you're still shooting for 2015. Yeah, well, we are we're we're well along in pre-production or pre-pre-production. We're we're it's very real. It's not just some idea. Um, Where's it going to film? Um, probably in Hungary. They have all these. They give you millions of dollars to film. If you will shoot there, and probably somewhat uh, some will be shot here in New York. Some will be shot in in London. It it, it depends. That has to be figured out. But I, I'm guessing most of it might be in Hungary. Okay. I seriously, I could just be the coffee run girl, whatever. I would love to come I on play, set. I want to play Hitler's I know. He won't let me. Oh, I thought you wanted to play Hitler himself. Well, that would be my first choice, yeah. They're not going to let you play in it? I don't, I don't know. You I have to make a cameo. Okay. That's so Hitchcock. We have to, we have to, we have to um, talk about this in another interview when I actually will know this stuff. So, and, and, uh, and I know, Joy, you really will do other interviews. I know that. Because this is just what you do. It's you're very good at it. Oh, thank you. You've, and, lured, you've lured me into a sense of security and trust here, and no one's ever been able to to blow smoke that effectively. <laughs> you know, that's great. Yeah. Oh, I did have one final question from my father that he wanted me to relay to you. Um, he wanted to know how did you take an obscure uh, German uh, historical figure and turn it into a cash cow? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I always joke around for people who don't know the joke. I, I your dad's book uh, called Love and Respect. Mm. It's whatever sold over a million copies. And uh, I think that, you know, it's a brilliant idea. And so everywhere I go, I tell people about this book, Love and Respect. If you want a good book on marriage, Love and Respect. In fact, I just gave a copy to my barber. Oh, nice. And um, yes, I did. But I, I was going to say that at the heart of it, for people who don't know, is a scripture verse. And I don't even remember what the verse is. Is it Ephesians? Ephesians 5.33. Okay, Ephesians 5.33. Your dad sort of takes that verse and exegetes it 
brilliantly. And I thought in 2000 years, it doesn't seem anybody's seen this before, which is astounding. Yeah. So I always used to, to joke around that, yeah, he took a scripture verse and turned it into a cash cow, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I don't even remember the exact line. But yeah. So that was that was his pushback. Well, but as you know, everyone's first book, how much money do you really get from it? <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, thank you. I know you are a very busy man. You gave me far more time than you agreed to, but this has been so much fun and we will try to edit out all of the static, but we probably yeah. can't. It's just more, it's more gritty. It's real. Yeah. Gritty. It's gr- I'm in New York. What are you going to do? Yeah. You know, Hey, I didn't right. even hear that many sirens. This is so bizarre that I'm talking to you now. See, I'm not Technology. Used to, like, <laughs> that's what you said. That's what you said before we started recording, just so the people at home know. Uh, right. I was I was eating my breakfast before we started, and you're like, I feel like I'm uh, talking to someone on a spaceship. So yeah, that's that's right. technology. But, first. All right. Well, I hope you can do something with this. Probably not. Yeah, I know. She's gonna hit delete. <laughs> all, right. all right. Tell your family I said hello. And I shall. And you, yours. All right. Thank you. Bye. Are we? Are we happy? I'm so sorry. No, See, is, I, I consented to do this with you because I knew you'd have patience with me working out the kinks of the Skype world interview. So thank you. You're welcome. Technology is not anyone's friend. Oh, what's on your mug? Baron Munchausen is a folktale figure from like the 18th and 19th centuries. He's it's like a tall tale character, uh-huh. and he would do stuff like, you know, ride a cannonball through the air and fight alligators i actually do collect mugs like when i travel and stuff but this mug is by thermos it's i'm a freak about temperature i like things to stay hot just to show you how different we are joy this summer when i was in greece Uh there was a mug of of coffee with cream that i'd been drinking right and i let it get cold it was seated it was outside right and it wasn't cold but it was almost cold and it was seated outside but i thought i don't care so i took a swig of it okay as i took the swig I realized that a hornet was half drowned in the final swig. He'd gone in there, half drowned. He was in my mouth. He woke up, stung me on the side of the lip. No. I spit him and the coffee out, obviously, everywhere. And I sounded like Sylvester Stallone for 48 hours. That, that, so he had enough fight left in him. That- yeah, to, to ruin my day. <laughs>